It was the swinging year of 1963 when American writer and illustrator Maurice Sendak created the now iconic picture book, Where the Wild Things Are. The book has been adapted several times in a few different mediums, including an animated short in 1974 and again 12 years later, a 1980 opera, and the live-action 2009 feature film adaptation directed by Spike Jones, which we're going to talk about now in this episode. Both the film and the book came out to mixed reactions. In fact, child psychologist Bruno Bettelheim urged parents to keep away from it. Libraries banned it from their shelves while the book continued to receive negative reviews. It took about two years for librarians and teachers to realize that children were flocking to Sendak's work, checking it out over and over again, and for critics to relax their views. The film has followed a similar path, with fans of the book denouncing the work as unfaithful to the vision from their past. So we decided to jump into our wolf suits and try to find every difference we could between the picture book and the movie. Let the wild rumpus begin! I'm Michael Truly. And I'm Casey Redman. So, without further ado and no restraint on spoilers, what's the difference? There's a lot of overthinking to do on where the wild things are, but let's start with the basics. Both the book and the movie are about a boy who uses his imagination to come to terms with his emotions. Both the book and the movie are told in the third person, but are positioned from the boy's perspective, showing things that happen only in his imagination. In both works, the boy is angry at the lack of control and power he has in his own life, and he explores that by imagining an island of wild monsters who make him their king. It's like my real life, basically. The look, feel, and scope of the world is similar to that of the book, but otherwise that's about where the similarities end, and the differences begin between the 20-page book, made up of only 10 sentences and 338 words, and the one hour and 44 minute long feature film. Seriously, this is the entire book in words. So we're not quite sure if people who were mad about the film's lack of loyalty wanted a 10-minute film or a two-hour-long wordless rumpus, but bringing the book to life word for word in a feature film seems impossible without a bit of embellishment. So it comes as no surprise that Jones expanded on the story. It's complicated. I don't even know how everything got this way. Jones's film is enamored with the book, but not beholden to it. Max still charges around the house in his beloved wolf suit, terrorizing the dog, building a blanket for it, and threatening to eat up his loving but exasperated mother, who we never see in the book. On the other hand, his father is absent, though not necessarily present in the book. His mother brings her work troubles home as well as her new beau, and his only exists in the film teenage sister lets him down at a moment that is uncomfortable to watch. Then, in his hurt, Max does something to get even with his sister that can't be undone. Both moments are crude and hard, not because of what happens to Max physically, but because they pack the sting of a white-hot childhood memory seared into your mind. A place in your psyche where you are forever that distressed child, because we all lived it in one way or another. The movie does not include the iconic scene in which the young wild Max, sent to his room without supper, watches his bedposts branch into trees as a forest swallows his room. Instead, after the fight with his mother, Max runs away into the night and through a nearby forest, where he finds a boat that carries him away. Just like in the book, Max travels by sea, although the time it takes for him to reach the island is unclear. It certainly takes days, but there's no indication that it took close to a year like it does in the book. Also take note of Max's name that is carved into the side of the boat. In the book, his name is there from the beginning. But in the film, we see Max carve it into the side of the boat during his voyage. This minor change propels the ambiguity Jones creates around Max's adventure. The audience is given a chance to interpret the story as a boy who finds a boat and takes off towards a very real mystical island full of monstrous creatures. As opposed to the book, which leads you into the idea that all the fantastical events occur inside Max's own mind from the very beginning. Once Max arrives at his destination, he is not greeted by the giant sea monster from the book. Instead, he abandons his vessel and braves the dangerous rocky shore to find the wild things in the middle of some personal drama. Is anyone going to help me? The wild things themselves look as if they've jumped straight out of Syndac's cross-hatched pages. And while they're no less alarming than their literary counterparts, they're much more complicated and harder to manage. I think you should apologize to Bob and Terry. I don't apologize to owls. Owls are stupid. Max wants escape. The forest, the boat, and the island of the wild things can be seen as a flight into fantasy. But just like in the book, it's not a fantasy of comforting wish fulfillment. He finds the things directionless and irascible, and most of them initially want to eat him. In the book, Max dominates the things with the magic trick of an unblinking stare. But in the film, he has to convince them that his magical powers are greater than that. But you're so small. Small is good. My powers are able to slip right through the cracks. And once the cracks are closed up, 
Then I have a recracker which goes right through that. But what if they have some sort of material that recrackers can't get through? Then I have a double recracker which can get through anything in this whole universe ever, period. Wow, he has a double recracker. He does sound powerful. Carol, though, wants to know if his powers are any good against loneliness or sadness. I have a sadness shield, Max ventures unconvincingly, but the things are willing to go along with it for now. We finally get our wild rumpus, but unlike the book, there's no swinging from trees like monkeys. Just a jolly run through the forest to the whimsical sounds of Karen O. The rumpus ends with Max asleep in a pile of wild things instead of in a tent next to them. Unlike the book, where Max only spends one night on the island, film Max spends a good deal of time there. Max and the things embark on an ambitious project to create a special place where only things you want to happen will happen. A fantastic secret fortress, a world within their world within a world, where perhaps they will find the sadness shield that Max has promised. While the Wild Things names are not mentioned in the book, Sendak has gone on record saying that each one is named after his aunts and uncles. These names were changed for the film. Bernard. The Bull. Bruno. Ira. Emil. It's Douglas. Goat Boy. Alexander. Zippy. KW. Aaron. Judith. Moisha. Carol. In the book, the wild things don't have individual personalities or emotions. But in the film, the things are potent symbols of childhood emotion. You could carry me like a little baby. Carol blends Max's angry destructive impulses and anxieties with Max's mother's concern, while in some ways filling a bit of the absentee father role. It's not hard to see where Carol and KW's quarrels come from. KW's absence reminds Max of his missing dad. But Max's sister is also visible in KW, off cavorting with her new friends and leaving Carol and thus Max in the lurch. Among the most revealing moments is an outburst from Judith. You can't do that back to me. If we're upset, your job is not to get upset back at us. It is Max's voice, uttering his own unspoken plea to his mother. In another scene, Max flings at Carol the very words his mother yelled at him at the beginning of the film. You're out of control! I'm not out of control! In the end, Book Max decides to leave, which angers the wild things. They try to stop him by threatening to eat him. Movie Max realizes it's his time, and the friends all have a prolonged and sad farewell. <laughs> Max returns home not to a warm supper alone in his room, but to a slice of cake and the warm embrace from his mother's arms. In the end, the greatest difference between Sindak's book and Jones's film is that the book is about anger, while the film is as much about sadness. Many people wanted something closer to Sindak, something simpler and less talky, with more attention to the book's most striking images. A common criticism of the film pushes that the story is too dark, the children too complicated and unlikable, and the themes too adult. I don't get it. Oh, wait, I do. It's stupid. In context, though, Sindak based the book around his own childhood, filled with real emotions. The personal nature of it is what made it so ahead of its time, and of course, controversial. Sindak spent much of the 50s illustrating the works of others, including the Little Bear series, and describes typical post-war kids' books as training manuals. How to behave, and what was acceptable, what was not acceptable. In other words, boring, and a complete misunderstanding of the nature of children. But the blonde, innocent kids cavorting alongside friendly animals didn't resemble the world Sindak knew. Sindak describes his childhood as lonely and alienated, shadowed by poverty, and haunted by the loss of relatives to the Nazis. So we look to the European tradition, which he calls more sophisticated, allowing for the complexity of childhood, which we didn't. Sindak's books were groundbreaking for their darker stories, their more torrid families, and their less sentimentalized protagonists. So Jones based it very personally on his own life, alienating a lot of viewers, but potentially creating something deeper and long-lasting. Because of that, despite the lack of sea monsters, the long bouts of talking, and the addition of cake, these two versions of the story might be more similar than divergent. Man, you really have us figured out. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's all for now. I bet you either want to pop in the movie or read the book in the next 30 seconds, or, you know, just put on your PJs and break some shit. Like this video if you want to see more of What's the Difference. Make sure to subscribe to Cinefix for more awesome movie content. And let us know in the comments what you thought about all the changes. Did we miss something? Let us know. See you next time.